Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Fifth Estate at the Wheeler Centre. I'm Sally Warhaft, and uh, it's such a pleasure to be here tonight. It's our last Fifth Estate for the year, and um, it's extra special because we're talking about China here in the Great Hall of the Wheeler Centre, and uh, it's people, politics, power and economics, and uh, joining me is uh, the China correspondent for Fairfax, the Sydney Morning Herald, and The Age, and also a writer for Foreign Policy magazine, winner of the 2009 Walkley Award for Scoop of the Year, reporting the detention of Australian Rio Tinto executive Stern Hu, author of The Rise and Fall of the House of Bo, which you can purchase down the back um, at the uh, at the end of the session, please welcome straight back from Beijing just yesterday, John Garno. John, welcome. You lived in Beijing for a couple of years in the 1980s when your father was the foreign ambassador. Yeah. And you then returned in 2007 as the uh, Fairfax correspondent. You must have been, what, a, a teenager when you were there? Yeah, look, I was just a kid. Yep. Oh, I'm 12, 13 in the 80s. All right. Uh, so what, it, it, I'm just general impressions from, from when you were, I bet you were a pretty smart kid, um, you know, that you, you took in and then you go back there as a professional, as a journalist. Yeah. Um, you, know, what, what, you know, what did you notice even from being a, ch a child in, in its changes? Uh, look, we lived, or where we lived at the time was, um, I don't know if you guys have been to Beijing, there's the Lido Hotel, which is, in those days, it was surrounded by wheat fields um, and literally donkeys going down the airport road. Um, now it's just that same place is surrounded by a sea of skyscrapers. Um, um, but the thing that I noticed most was actually the smell has changed. Um, in And I, you don't remember, you remember smells until they're not the same. And um, I remember yeah. getting off the plane in Beijing and it wasn't the cooking stove, oil and coal kind of nostalgic smell that I remembered, but it was the car exhaust carbon monoxide. Mm. Um, you know, and that was kind of the first thing that struck me about changing, changing China. Um, but perhaps I think the most important thing, you know, in some ways being there in the 80s is a misleading experience because that was the enlightenment moment of China where everybody was debating everything. You know, there were sprinkled amongst them terrific people uh, in charge and in different places and everybody was searching for ideas. Mm -hmm. um, come back 20 years later and it's a much more kind of um, closed uh, political system than it was. Um, but I think the thing that really helped me more than anything was the knowledge that there are actually really good people sprinkled throughout the system still. Um, and so that kind of gave a, an immediate contact point um, into the system, knowing that they are there somewhere and, um, uh, and it is possible to open a conversation. Well, that's an interesting um, little prelude into my next question. It's the last one sort of about you, um, <laughs> but, but to set the scene for us about what it's like to, to live and work there as mm. a journalist and how do you go about um, getting inside to get your stories and getting to know people and then getting them to talk? Um, look, this is a, you know, it's a challenge being a journalist anywhere because the instincts of, of governments and, and um, companies and anybody in power is only to talk on their own terms. Mm. Um, you know, China's got sort of Chinese characteristics overlaid on top of that. And in the end, it's actually not that different. Um, you know, on the edges of the system, there are think tanks, there are universities which tap in perhaps even more directly than they do in in our system, you know, our system is actually particularly bad at it, I think. Um, and so you can kind of get a glimpse at the edge of the policy process. Not, it's not that difficult to do. Um, and as you kind of scrape away deeper, I think two things happen. One is you get to know people who introduce you to other people, you know, mm -hmm. like in any journalistic environment, and perhaps more so in China. And there was a moment where I suddenly realised that all these doors, which I thought were going to always remain closed, you know, you can actually walk inside. Um, and the second, another thing is, you know, to 
you can do it completely on your terms. Um, you don't have to attend the official press conference where the same party speak is told, you know, day in, day out. You can totally move amongst the most interesting people in the most interesting country in in the world. Um, and it just takes a long time to work out where those nodes of, of interest are and, you know, where the where the leverage points are. And once people get the sense that you are investing in in their thought processes, in their history, in their conversations, um, you know, like anywhere in the world, people want to be heard and understood. Hmm. It seems there are three, you know, really obvious things to discuss about China. There's its economic model, its political culture, and the relationship with the outside world. Mm. Um, so let's start with the, the economic, uh, the economics and this r- remarkable performance over the last three decades and incredible economic power. What, what is it, what's important for us um, who are not Sinophiles, um, but are interested and engaged mm. uh, to understand about what is going on um, economically mm. within China? Um, I think they are the three big questions. Good, you know. thank God. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, the first is, you know, this is a world... F- you know, this is a, an experiment. The, the world's never tried to develop a, to this extent, a marketized opening economy with a political dictatorship to this extent before. So we are in uncharted um, territory. There is no set flight path um, for this. Um, And so we should always be kind of conscious that what, you know, the rear vision mirror is not always going to be the best guide to the future. Um, But I think at this point, what we are seeing is, you know, people have, for 25 years, people have been saying at some point we're going to see the contradiction between the closed political system and the pluralistic uh, market economy. And there's a feeling amongst the elite, amongst the the leaders of the financial system, amongst economists and amongst the liberal intelligentsia that we're actually just about to... We're we're at that point now. Um, So this this is the moment of reckoning where the old... Deng Xiaoping consensus um, needs to be adjusted perhaps quite significantly because we've just we've, we've reached the end of the map you know now everything's more sophisticated we have to depend on innovation how can you do that when there is no law and therefore no intellectual property rights mm. um, how can you how can a command economy really take stock of the extraordinary complexity of, of uh, modern economic life in a country so large you know I think these are actually the very questions that um, all economically literate people in China are grappling with right now. Because we think of it as so controlled, but the way you describe it, it mm. sounds kind of out of control. Um, look, I think out of control is a better, <laughs> is a better um, phrase at the moment. Um, and it wasn't always thus, but this is, when you think of this enormous Leninist system where there's unbelievable stratification, hierarchy of, of power on the way down, and then an extraordinary um, horizontal diversity as well, you know, a very siloed system. This was, not des- this, was, uh, this was designed to have a Mao or a Stalin or a Lenin or even a Deng Xiaoping kind of, you know, drive his, his view down and have it kind of implemented all the way down. That doesn't happen, well, that hasn't happened lately. Um, and I think this is in the last 10 years in particular, there's a sense that all these state-owned actors, the you know, parts of the military, these state-owned companies, bureaucracies at every level, departmentally um, and locally, um, have been seeing this as an opportunity to, to obtain and gather as many resources as they can to expand their own empires, bugger the national interest kind of thing. And we, you know, we really do need... A, um, a, a, an arbiter, a, a way to kind of mediate the, that contest for resources and, and power. Um, surveys, you know, suggest there's a high level of satisfaction among Chinese people for the mm. way the economy has grown, but there's also rising inequality. What is, is are the Chinese people as satisfied on mass as? we're led to believe, do you think? Yeah, look, surveys are really difficult, in, in particularly in China. Um, I mean, you just can't do it um, normally. Uh, that said, um, I think you've, it's just a fact that people give, you know, there's a certain amount of credit for the, for 
the political status quo, given the fact that people are now much more prosperous than they used to be. You know, that's true. But I sense that that credit is rapidly um, being eroded down as people widen their aspirations and the 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 contest has been has moved from just can I kind of materially advance myself to to justice I think mm. is the is the number one kind of concern at the moment it's not just that okay I've got my television sh set and maybe even set my kids overseas but um, what about that person over there they've got to where they are because of their connections and cronyism and corruption etc and that's not fair or you know I don't like the fact that, you know, before I would have worn the fact that the party official bulldozes my, my house and builds a road because that's in the national interest or whatever, it's, you know, it's beyond me. But now there's a real sense of, actually, that's my apartment or my house. Um, there's I'm a guy this it. week in the paper, I'm sure many people <laughs> saw it, who just refused to move out of his apartment and they're building a six-lane highway around him. Oh, it's classic. I mean, there's, there's the, the, the nail house phenomenon is, uh, is very real where um, it's much harder for for I mean, this is almost the key kind of phenomenon in China. It's just so much harder just to bulldoze people. Um, and so you do have this phenomenon. This guy's actually got his house in the middle of a six-lane freeway. <laughs> um, I want to touch on that. You talked about cronyism and corruption. And uh, um, how... I mean, I, I know India, and I, mm. I know how that sort of stuff works. It, it, it's, mm. it's right through. There's a... Mm. Um, except perhaps... At the very top, it's different to, to, to China. How mm. much does it affect the everyday life of, of most Chinese people? Yeah, look, it, it, it does all the time, actually. Right. Um, you know, if... You know, and is, so it, is it all bad? To... Well, I mean, it's, there's... There, there was a, you know, a lot of discourse about whether there's good corruption and bad corruption, or at least development facilitating corruption, and and development stopping corruption. Um, you know, I think if there was such a distinction in China, that's breaking down at the moment, um, where we can see that that corruption is actually perverting um, policy goals, you know, all the way down, and. This is a system that has so much administrative power and it's almost designed to maximise um, uh, grey income for officials at every step. Um, and until you start to do one of your... There's two things, you know, until you actually reduce the administrative power of all these officials in every part of your life, whether it's how many children you can have or the work that you get assigned or um, getting entry into university um, or building a four-lane, six-lane highway outside your front door. Um, you know, at, at the moment, there's very little feedback mechanism to hold officials accountable upwards. Um, and at the same time, there's very little transparency. So you can actually never work out who made what decision and who benefited. So at the moment, it's a, it's a, it's a grey income maximising system. And I think that is really obstructing the kind of the national project. Mm. Let's get into the uh, political culture, uh, from the day-to-day -day corruption to the uh, recent 18th Congress of the Chinese mm. Communist Party in a leadership transition. Tell us about that transfer of power, about who is most important in that um, and, and what, it, what it means. Yeah, look, it's, um, this is the question the whole world is really asking. Well, we, we know you've got the answers, John. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> um, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that have come together um, just right now. One is that almost overnight there's a consensus that the Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao administration failed. You know, I'm not here to judge whether that's right or wrong, but there's an elite consensus that what they set out to do, and that was to address inequality, to create a harmonious society, um, has not been achieved, and all sorts of more minor policy goals have not been achieved. So in a way, that's a great setup for any new regime. To, be, to have everybody bagging the old regime is, uh, you know, that's the first thing any new chief executive would do. You know? It's like coming in after George W. Bush, exactly, isn't it? Here exactly. we are. <laughs> we all want to love the new guy. Yeah. Um, and so Xi Jinping comes at that time where he has a, you know, almost a mandate to, to address, to make significant changes, and that really helps. 
And then there's a second thing about, you know, who this guy is and the new generation of, of leaders. And there's no question he is different and they are different. And what we need to know is whether that's enough to actually change this massive system. How, how is he different? Look, I don't know if anybody saw the um, coverage of his first appearance as General Secretary of the party. And if you compare that to Hu Jintao 10 years ago, where Hu Jintao basically read, he doesn't read, he memorises his script. And Hu Jintao was all in party speak, whereas Xi Jinping was, he was, he was relaxed. He looks like he was actually communicating with the people on the other side of the TV sets. Um, he talked about, you know, he nailed, it was just like you'd expect a well-trained politician to do here. He nailed health, uh, clean environment, education, you know, bang, 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 that's what everybody wants to it hear about. It was like a sort yeah. of the Labor Party here, wasn't it? It uh, was. It, I it mean, was. they're the same things <laughs> is what I mean. That's... And, and, and equally dysfunctional <laughs> yeah. behind the scenes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't been that far away, have you? Mm. Um, What um, what might this change mean, uh, you know, within China and and to the world? I suppose, mm. um, and and you know, who is it more likely to to benefit? Because there's just these these two. The, 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 it seems to me this incredible challenge for for him to. Um, you know he's got to he's got to keep the economy going and he's got to keep social cohesion will he be brave and reformist yeah. or will he just keep on the same track um, and this is the the the, uh, the multi trillion dollar question um, Look, I, I think there are already signs that he wants to move. Um, there was a imp really important publicized address by Li Keqiang the Premier in waiting, who will be his key economic manager. Um, for the first time in 10 years, there was real kind of repeated talk about reform, 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 uh, and marketisation. We really haven't heard that message for a long time. So that signals that on the economic front, they want to um, at least recommit to a path of opening and reform on the economic side. Now. I expect that that's going to happen to some extent over the next two years. Um, it's really a question of how much political capital they turn out to have. Um, can Xi Jinping, is he the guy with Li Keqiang to attack all these extraordinarily strong and tough vested interests in the system in a way that hasn't been done for the last 10 years? Can he take away the power and the resources and the grey income of the guys who are in his own central committee, you know, running the companies, running the military, uh, running the bureaucracies? You know, I, my personal sense, and it is only a guess, that we are going to see some pretty positive signs in the next year and a half on that first stage mm. of the reform agenda. Are they really smart, these guys? Are they well-educated? Are they... Um, you know, what sort of people are they? Yeah. Look, these guys are, on the generational front, it is a very different cohort to the last, to the last lot. These are the guys that um, their formative experiences were the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. You know, they kind of reach puberty and a whole, all hell blows open for them, sort of. Um, so they were Red Guards, they were beaten up by Red Guards, their families were attacking, their families were attacked. They went and spent time in the countryside, like years on end, in the case of um, Xi Jinping, um, lived amongst the peasants. Uh, the, you know, most party officials never get the opportunity to actually mix with ordinary people, but they have somewhere in their long distant past done that. So a lot of their peers and contemporaries in the elite hold great hope just on that, on that fact that these guys know what it's like to live real lives. Um, and they're also the first real university degree generation of, you know, came out of the Cultural Revolution straight into that first intake at Peking University, Tsinghua University, and that's Li Keqiang and, and Xi Jinping, but, but most of them actually, unlike the last lot, they didn't all study aeronautical engineering um, or hydro engineering. Um, you know, they studied law, they studied ec uh, economics, they mixed with really interesting people. Um, I mean, Li Keqiang is actually an extraordinary case study himself, this is the Premier in waiting, he, he translated um, 
Look, I can't remember. I should admit this. My former boss from my law firm is here, but was it Lord Denning? Is that his name? They translated uh, Lika Chum personally um, translated Denning's something or other on contract law, um, and you know this is an experience that none of their predecessors have had. So I think they are smart on average, you know, without saying that these are kind of, you know, this uniquely meritocratic Chinese system because it's not, but they do have somewhere in them the ingredients for intelligent um, decision making. Whether that all comes together is, is the question. Mm. There's something I think for a lot of people, and certainly for me, very mysterious about China, um, mm. even though I, you know, I've, I've, I've embrace Asia, I've been just about everywhere in Asia but China um, but there's something standoffish about it, there's something uh, what, what, what is that? I mean it's not just that it's authoritarian or communist um, this, what is it about the Chinese sort of version of its communism and its mm. culture um, that, that is particularly Chinese. Yeah, I, I guess what you're referring to is the kind of superimposing Leninism, Maoism on this sort of two and a half thousand year old kind of cultural That's civilization. That's so how I wanted to put it. Yes. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. and, and, and the results, you know, reinforced by the state system, you know, can be a pretty... Um, impenetrable combination, even chauvinistic combination at times, you know, in the wrong combinations. Um, I actually, as you were describing China, it's actually how I feel about India. I'm not yet right. old enough to go to India because it's too complicated. <laughs> um, and there's so many layers. Well, we can show each other around, right? <laughs> I'd love to. Yeah. I'd love to. Um, but I think, um, you know, if China was ever like... I mean, China was a super close system, you know, for, for 30 years at least. Um, but it's not anymore. It's all despite the political system hardly changing at all, it is a pluralistic society with people getting richer, their horizons are, you can, you know, even in the five years I've been there, I've seen such a, a hyper-accelerated evolution of kind of society and people's own aspirations, their horizons broadening all the time, opening to, you know, this is the internet age, the, the, rev inter the information revolution, everybody's, if they haven't been overseas themselves, they know somebody who's living overseas. So there are, you know, there are lots of entry points into China that, um, that weren't there um, 30 years, 35 years ago. So I think you should just try. I think maybe one of the other parts of this is, is that the entry point of China into Australia, um, which for, for is most prominent in um, our mining culture and the acquisition yeah. of things and so on, and that, you know, I think, I think people worry about that. They worry about the dependence, economic dependence, on a country um, that is not open and democratic and, yeah. and so on. Is it, a, is it a fear you understand and, and is, it, is it legitimate? Um, look, I can certainly understand the fear and I, think, and I think there's a real place for kind of analysing what, are, what exactly are we afraid of here. Now, personally, I wasn't so nervous that a bit of the Simpson Desert's been sold to Chinalco or whatever, um, but it is a much more complicated equation when you do have state-owned companies where the, where the chief executives and presidents are appointed directly by the organisation department. They've got Communist Party cells inside them. Um, we know that if the governance practices from back in China are transferred to Australia. We've already seen it. You know, they just don't work because there's no, um, you know, there's no human resources management capability. There's, um, there's a tolerance for corruption, which Australia is not used to. Um, it's, a, it's an environment where you, what you, in China, you cultivate the, the patron in the political system and then you just do it. And then kind of you work back through the paperwork afterwards. And in, in Australia, it doesn't work like that. So there's a lot of... If only, think the leaders, if only. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Here we just leave it on someone's planning desk for five or ten years until, right. it, until it goes away. I mean, it really is different, isn't it? And it's, a, yeah. um, I suppose... Uh, also, we're also being asked to believe that the, the good times are just going to keep on going in China, mm. which signs are actually that that may not be true, uh, certainly the trajectory that it's been on, yeah. um, and that, you know, there goes China, there, there go us. Is, is, that, is yeah. that reasonable? Um, 
Look, I, I think, but it's, uh, look, personally, I think Australia is still an extraordinarily privileged economic position as much by chance as anything else. But um, um, look, there is the kind of huge question marks about the Chinese model, you know, is it sustainable? How does it have to change to become sustainable? Um, and maybe those structural adjustments that need to happen and perhaps are already starting to happen inside China are kind of more important for Australia than the kind of the headline GDP growth. And I do think that there's an awful need to kind of get our heads around the finer grain of what's happening on the economic front, even before you talk about the political uh, leverage and dependency that that brings. Um, for, you know, for example, I think in, in the last six months in particular, you know, the resources sector in Australia has had a huge thump and a huge shock, which is partly a deceleration of the growth of the headline GDP growth, but it's much more about um, the fact that this time round, the party decided not to pump up all these, um, the, you know, the overinvestment construction sort of sector that um, as they had been doing for the last two or three years. So it looks like the first stage possibly of a structural transition. So we might be talking about a far less resource intensive pathway of GDP growth in the next 10 years than we've seen in the last. And if so, that's got huge implications for um, for Australian economy as a, as a whole, but also which sectors of the Australian economy now need to kind of rise to the challenge. How do the Chinese people feel about reform? Um, are they, you know, is it is it sort of like here where there's, you know, people assume that economy is paramount hmm. um, and that, you know, other things follow. What, what sort of changes do you think your average, if you can, you can't talk about an average Chinese person, hmm. but, but what, what do you think Chinese people, um, if, you know, what sort of reforms would they, would they be asking for if they could shout them out? Um. Look, I think I think there's always been a, because there's been such strong GDP growth for so long that I, you know I personally suspect that they'd be more well, for the people I deal with all the time. You know, people are more focused on the individual household, social, political um, reforms that need to happen. And even if they don't use the language of reform, they'd prefer that that official no longer kind of um, treats them in the way they. Did. So that, that grassroots kind of the justice question is all, you know, at the moment, I think is overriding the overall macro economy question. Reform has lost, you know, it's no longer, at the moment, it's no longer the taken for granted as a good thing mantra as it was in the 80s and even the 90s. Um, and in fact, that little book that you held up before, Borsi Lai was, um, you know, he was responding to something that he was responding to a sense in the community that the reform was no longer the answer. All the reform has been kind of hijacked to benefit the elite. And so it has to be repackaged and resold if it's going to be kind of uh, a palatable political formula again. It's got to be explained. And lots of Chinese intellectuals are, uh, you know, are talking about this. How can we explain that reform is not the reason why there's such gaping inequalities and injustice in Chinese society? You know, it should be the answer to these problems. Um, you know, this is a very complicated political message to, to massage. Are they talking about the Arab Spring? Uh, look, n nobody in power likes to talk directly too much about the Arab Spring, but it's absolutely under the surface. Mm. Um, and at the time, I mean, this is February, March last year, and I actually remember I was in um, I was in Los Angeles talking to a much smaller crowd, and um, and people are asking. They ask me the question as I often do. You know, what's it like being a journalist in China? Oh, you know, it's actually quite fine, good. And 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 I got home and checked my email, and the guy from Bloomberg had just been beaten up in his apartment, and you know, and so you know, I got back to China. You know, I missed the week of the Arab Spring, but I got back, and it really was a moment where where the whole of the political system just kind of crystallises, comes into kind of the old revolutionary self-protection kind of mode. Um, and we can, you know, later we've, we've had some insights into the sort of messages that were kind of going on behind the scenes, but it was maximise the security apparatus. Um, that was the peak of the disappearing lawyers and intellectuals um, because it, it, and, and all kinds of complicated bureaucratic and personal games going on too. You know, the, 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 the person responsible for public security cannot afford to have something uh, go wrong in that time, and you know, so they 
there's no downside on maxi maximising the, the security response. Um, there was a huge propaganda kind of campaign going on behind the scenes, which we could see all through the media, about playing up the damage and the danger of the Arab Spring, not really talking about the underlying causes. Um, but this was not a uniform position inside the, inside the, um, in the elite. You know, if, if I can give you two examples. Um, at that time, I got hold of a speech by one of the... Uh, the generals who's been making a few waves, the son of Liu Xiaoqi, and he was all talking about um, identifying with the predicament of Gaddafi, and um, you know, and that was my first impression too. Like, wow, that's unusual because this is actually a guy who's who's capable of mixing with the people and understanding kind of the. But but when it came to, you know, where does he really stand? You know, he doesn't want to be the guy that's kind of left in a dragged out of a drain like Gaddafi, and he's talking. And the system has to find a narrative which doesn't, which it can respond to, and not allowed to undermine it. And so it becomes a... It, Gaddafi's downfall was caused by the Western hostile forces. You know, it's a NATO project. Um, he was... You know, his son was converted while he was overseas by foreign spies. That's what we in the Communist Party have to defend ourselves against. Um, you know, extraordinary sort of 1940s underground revolutionary party sort of stuff. But it's actually really a core part of the Communist Party today. At the same time, just one month later, Premier Wen Jiabao, who, of course, we all know is the, the sole lonely flag bearer for, for a liberal, a more liberal future, he got asked a similar question. And he said, we cannot forget the lessons of the Arab Spring. People demand democracy and they demand justice and they cannot be left out of the economic equation, which is the polar opposite of the of the core Communist Party mechanism, but I just thought that was a standout example of these contests about the future of China that are going on. Was Gaddafi his own fault or the fault of the, of the Western hostile forces? Mm. Just to um, bring it back home a bit more and the, the pressure points for Bob Carr and the Australian government mm. in, in managing the relationship with Australia, uh, with, with China, what, what what do you think they are? I mean, they're, because they're, they're usually not the ones, you know, on the outside that you think of. What, mm. What's troubling the government? I mean, it's one thing Australia and China and all governments. It's probably what we think is troubling them is it's not actually it. Mm. What, what, what might be the, the kind of pressure points for a foreign minister at the moment, Australian foreign minister? Yeah. And uh, the government? Yeah. I mean, there's two questions that any Australian official gets hit with and repeatedly when they arrive in Beijing. One is, uh, what do you tell, explain to us the meaning of having a two and a half thousand American Marines in Darwin? Is that to um, defend against China? Do you see China as a threat? So that is a real mainstream and where, question. And where is Kevin? Is that the second? No. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened to Kevin? We were just, <laughs> we were just getting used to that guy. And you're going to <laughs> Um, Sorry. And, and the second question they raise all the time is, um, um, are you discriminating against Chinese state-owned enterprises? You know, I'm, I'm not actually offering a view on the validity of, of their concerns, but that's the two, they're the two headline um, issues. In a way, they're kind of easier to deal with, you know, that's, that dis and then it gets battered across the table, oh, no, these American troops and all these things we're doing with the Americans in every other country in Southeast Asia has got nothing to do with China, you know, and it goes back and forth across the table and everyone goes home. And the same with state-owned enterprises. We've got, it's not against Chinese companies, you know, it's just we've got a foreign investment, it's all independent. Um, um, and so kind of these uh, sort of partial truths get traded across the table. I think the more difficult questions, which no, and partly because nobody directly addresses them, um, are not so clear cut. Um, um, what do we think about the roles that, you know, the extraordinary um, efforts that the party system makes to influence and at times organise, you know, this enormous and, and generally quite pluralistic ethnic Chinese community in Australia? Um, what do we think about the fact that Effectively, the propaganda department in Beijing controls most of the Chinese language press in, in Australia. Um, um, what do we think about uh, you know, the, the rule of law? How do we engage with, with China's... You know, every, nobody in China disputes that, that 
they want to be heading to a more lawful society. Um, but how does Australia kind of play a useful and productive role? It's never going to be a leading role, but to be more helpful than unhelpful. What do we do when Australians and Australian um, businesses get caught up in the Chinese legal jungle, you know, as we've seen quite recently with the case of Du Zuying? Um, usually on those really difficult questions, which involve shades of grey, um, in my experience, that's when Australian foreign ministers and prime ministers and bureaucracy bureaucrats go and hide under the table. Who hasn't? Who's been good at it? Um, and look, who, do the, who have the Chinese sort of liked? Look, nobody, unfortunately, has been particularly good at it in Australia for 15 years, I, I would say. Now, Does that mean it was what, Alexander Downer? Uh, look... <laughs> um, no, look... You know, in the in the in the 70s, Australia actually built up a lot of credit, which you know I think it's eroded at a rapid rate. But um, in the 70s, the, the Whitlam, Fraser, Stephen Fitzgerald, Hawke, um, Keating um, era was really quite. You know, Australia was quite pioneering and right at the forefront with engaging with the with the Chinese system. Um, you know, maybe those sort of opportunities never happen again because China doesn't need to engage with with middle tier country uh, countries in the same way anymore. But it's been a long time since we've had a real somebody who's both thought hard about these questions as they need to be thought about um, and executed. Now, Kevin Rudd was the standout thinker on, on, on these questions. He, um, you know, he really does have a mind that understands the history, the nuance, the complexity. Um, he's got something like 300,000 followers on Weibo, the Chinese microblog. And these are all terrific things. You know, he knows how to communicate with, with China and, and calibrate a sophisticated measure, uh, message. Um, but unfortunately, he completely fell down on the execution of that relationship um, in sometimes in quite extraordinary, baffling ways. Oh, and so, it's painful, John. It, 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 it was. Yeah. And so you know, that didn't work, and, but nor has the kind of the ostrich strategy of, you know, of the Howard government or the Gillard government uh, worked particularly effectively either. And is part of that just not understanding Asia as well as China? Is, is it... Or is it China? What, what, what do you think's going on there? Yeah, look, I... I, I mean, there's a similar problem with India. Yes. Yeah, don't get it. People don't seem to be able to relate at a political yeah. level anywhere near as well as at a cultural level. Yeah, look, I was just um, in a by company talking to... Um, Andrew Holden at the, um, at the Age, and, and we're talking about India. How do we make India an important story rather than an odd spot story? You know, how do we make it into the new China? And... Um, um, now, you know, I think we've got to do that, but you know, as fast as we can. But confining it to, to China, I think China is just has so many. It's so hard. It is hard. Um, is part of the reason you say we have to do it as fast as we can to step up to China, so there is someone else on the rise, mm. equal to China, that shares perhaps more of the Western. Western values. Um, look, I think I mean, it firstly comes from the fact that this is a, a, a country with you know one sixth of the world's, world's population, um, and we have actually a much easier, much easier channels and conduits to India, points of um, commonality that, mm. that aren't naturally there with China. So, just I think as a basic kind of matter of humanity, we've got to kind of understand what's going on. And you know, look, there's very little reason to think that that India, in its own very different way is not going to become the next China, you know. Um, so, of course, it's going to have an extraordinarily large impact on the China, on, on Australian, ec the Australian economy and international relations in the region, not least of which being the, the, um, the rivalry between India and China for influence in the region. So, sooner or later, we're going to have to grapple with it. I'd prefer to be ahead of the curve, as we were on China, um, mm. rather than behind it. Mm. I don't think um, there's ever been a historical moment where you've had a hegemon sort of on the demise as the United States is right now, even if it's sort of just starting um, a, a, a demise, and, and another potential hegemon um, more complicated mm. as to whether or not um, China could be a super singular mm. superpower, but certainly on, on the rise as fast... Um, and, and as mightily as they are, yeah. without war. 
Um, I, I can't think of a, an example. Um, yeah, well, that, a, that more than anything else, just that historical sort of mm. his, fact, uh, probably worries me more than anything else about about where this is all heading. Yeah. Perhaps not in our lifetimes, but maybe kids. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for that cheery thought. <laughs> <laughs> Um, At least your kids all speak the language, John. <laughs> That's right. Um, uh, look, I think the encouraging thing is that lots of people are saying that very thing that you're saying. They're well aware. People in China and the United States are very well versed in that history. Um, and despite the fact, to varying extents, China defines itself in opposition to the United States, and there's a lot of that going on in the United States the other direction, um, there's actually been, I mean, this has been, I mean, I, I grew up kind of watching um, American maladventures all across the world, and I've been really pleasantly surprised about uh, with the, the level of adroitness with which the United States under the Obama and Hillary Clinton administration has, has responded to China, very focused and often very surprisingly nuanced in the way it's, it's done it, you know, particularly working with, with um, with um, countries in the, in the region being, t being careful not to get ahead of where smaller countries are, you know, to pr provide a facilitating role rather than a leadership role um, in not, in, in providing a level of, of, of discipline to Chinese misbehaviour, which we've seen in the South China Sea and the East China Sea in, in, in particular. At the same time, both sides have done, I think, an extraordinarily successful job of building direct channels of communication. And this has only really been tested in the last, you know, this year really, there's been a series of um, super potentially explosive diplomatic incidents um, which have been diffused extraordinarily effectively f um, on both sides. And so the really, the optimistic thing is people that count in Beijing and Washington are very well aware of the history and the potential that the risk of nobody wants to start a war, China knows it couldn't win a war, the United States knows it'll be you know, uh, just a, an extraordinary costly adventure. The risk, of course, is of of an accident and an accident spilling out of control, you know, I think that risk is, is, is significant. Um, um, but people are there's a lot of hedging going on behind mm -hmm. the scenes. And so this, all we can say is, you know, we just hope that um, that, that level of thought um, continues. Mm. I'm going to um, throw it open to questions for the audience in a moment. So put your hand up and someone will hopefully put a microphone in it and, um, and uh, we'll go to that. While, while that's happening, I'll ask you um, one more question about how sensitive you think China is um, to the way it's viewed in the West? Uh, yeah, look, uh, um, the answer is yes, but it's actually much more sensitive to how it's being viewed within China. Um, uh, so I know I've noticed a very large shift in, in my dealings with five years ago, if I went down to the countryside and um, then there was a peasant who'd had all his land stolen and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, awful, brutal situation. Um, and he would still tell me that, you know, the reason I'm taking this great risk and talking to you is so you can pass my message on to Wen Jiabao in Beijing via the foreign media. Um, now, um, but, but always hedge with, should I be talking to a foreign journalist? You know, am I being anti-patriotic by, by showing China's dark side. I really think that's shifted enormously over the last five years where um, Chinese people all over the country, particularly the 200 million internet savvy Chinese people, um, are themselves discovering all sorts of things about their country which they hadn't really pieced together before and are insistent on change. This conversation is happening within China. It's no longer you know, the, the, the foreign, how foreigners view China is not as centrally important to the party's sense of self-image as, as it used to be. Mm. Okay. Um, I just wonder whether you could briefly address uh, the consequences, positive and negative, of the one-child policy uh, economically and socially? Um, yeah, well, I mean, this is, um, it's a really nice case study because one of the great mysteries 
is, you know, I arrived in China assuming, well, this obviously this is a disastrous policy because it does two things. Uh, it means we're going to have a, an accelerated ageing population, declining workforce pretty soon, uh, therefore they will stop it, and it's also a cause of enormous friction and occasionally brutality um, in Chinese society, uh, therefore we'll stop it. But it has, so the question is, well, why is it still c continuing in almost the same form as it was five years ago? Um, and the answer is because basically there's a, um, there's a ministry of birth control and without, if you didn't have a one child policy, you wouldn't have a ministry. And, <laughs> and, and nor would you have an, a, this whole tree of, um, you know, root system of, of, of administrative power at every level. Can you imagine the, the power that an administrator gets at a village level or a township level if they've got the power to decide whether you do or do not uh, keep your baby. You can also imagine the revenue, um, the, the revenue potential that such power will give um, a local government and a local official um, personally. So this is a, a key litmus test, I think, of, um, of whether change is possible. Will there be a, loosen will there be a more rational, in China's national interest, um, birth control policy, uh, a, loosening, a, a rational loosening of the one-child policy in the next couple of years? And, um, I don't know. This is, you know we'll, we'll see. It's a great test case. Uh, there's been a lot of fantastic reporting on China this year between the Bo Xilai stuff for the New York Times' story on whose family wealth or Evan Osnos' railway story. Do you think any of them will have an impact going forward? Uh, look, this is the first time where I've kind of um, identified with my foreign press kind of colleagues and thought we actually, we actually contributed collectively to the body of knowledge on, on, on how China works this year. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is the whole Borsi Lai. The main one is the Borsi Lai explosion. It did two things. It, it blew open the black box of Chinese politics in this little kind of um, test case of Chongqing. And so it made it more accessible. And, and you in the, before everything gets put back together and they kind of the waters close over and the official investigation is completed, that's a great opportunity for journalists to go and dig around the rubble. Um, and the second thing is it made editors... Look, I, I personally have felt quite blessed and lucky and privileged um, the whole way along. You know, I've had editors in Sydney and Melbourne who have given me a licence to do the job as I think it deserves and, and have assumed that Australian audiences actually want to know some of the detail um, that up until this year I think American and European audiences weren't prepared to indulge. So all of a sudden you've got editors all across the world in Washington and New York and London saying, we want to know about this guy. Who is Xi Jinping? Why haven't all these things happened? What is the future of China? Um, you know, there's, there's an interest which is being fed by readers throughout the world, which gives a license to reporters on the ground to actually, you know, to, for us to all do our jobs in a way that we haven't before. And it's had a real impact, um, in not least of which is this Wen Jiabao story that you mentioned. Mm. Thank you very much. A quick clarification, if I may, before my question. And uh, Sally, you introduced John as coming back. Uh, do you mean he's coming back for a visit? Just or do you mean he's visit. come back? Oh, OK, back well, well then you'll that's... You'll be, be back in Beijing. Uh, by New Year's. By yeah. New Year's. Yes, yeah. good. Um, what you have really achieved in an outstanding way, unlike any of your predecessors has been obviously your coverage of the princelings. Now, I wonder how you managed to go about that because it would not be easy. Um, well, thank you. That's very kind. I think, um, I think we've had a few good reporters over the years. Um, look, the, the princelings, my interest in the princelings and, and bordering on obsession at the moment is, was driven by a series of encounters where I remember back in 2009 and a very good friend of mine in Beijing who understands Chinese politics better than I could ever hope to said you just got to go to Chongqing there's this guy down there and he's going doing stuff that no ordinarily born Chinese person can do so there was obviously something about 
the birth status of having a father that's a great revolutionary, or in some cases a mother as well, who, um, um, which allows you to, to, to talk in ways and get things done in ways and have, I think most importantly, have a kind of general level of risk insurance. You don't get penalised for mistakes if you're a princeling. And so these... And I started seeing examples of this all across the country, even from the artist Ai Weiwei. How did he get along? You know, the, the, the amazing thing was not that he disappeared for 81 la days last year after the Arab Spring, but that he got away for so long with doing what he did. And the answer is because his father was a great poet of the revolution who Wen Jiabao had been quoting at these national press conference. You know. um, and so... Uh, as you know, and there were more and more of these characters I came across by accident, and then I made it a project. Um, and there was a point at which there's a kind of a critical mass thing where, uh, where you know, people often say, "So who else have you talked to?" Well, the guy you went to school with, and this guy who. So all right, you know, I'll add my two cents to that. And so doors naturally open and perhaps even more in the Chinese system, this incredibly networked, family-oriented system. These guys all went to school together. They all visit each other at Spring Festival, you know, go to the same funerals and weddings and, and, and birthday anniversaries. And so there was a referral process, the sort of informal referral process that happened um, as well, coupled with the fact that this is the moment where everybody in China has an opinion on where the country is going and where it should be going. And so suddenly there was a whole category of people who wanted to, to talk and be understood, I think. Okay. Um, I think it's interesting, well, it's important, I think, to take a historical perspective on this question, and I'm a historian, and I, I think uh, I would question some of your terminology. You know, you referred to Leninism and um, being equivalent to, you know, Maoism and also um, just looking at the current developments. I, I think when you look at it, it's a development of actually a Stalinist system, uh, a command economy. And I think what happened with under Deng, that you did actually have a conscious decision to adopt market mechanisms. Now, we have got a political structure which... Uh, is fairly heterogeneous in a sense that I don't think the political elite quite knows what to do. They don't quite want to go in the direction of Russia uh, in 1999. Uh, and I think, you know, there are forces, of course, there are a number of contradictory forces uh, which are contesting with each other. Now, I think China, if it question. adopts... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask a question in a second, but if it adopts... Uh, a capitalist model, I think it's an ecological disaster. I cannot see how the world could actually sustain itself in the next 50 years with an adoption of uh, an industrial model based on the United we States. Need a question. So the question is uh, how much consciousness is actually about this and are they going to um, disintegrate uh, into a civil war or are they going to uh, have some kind of a transi transition? which is actually conscious of a different model to what the yeah. West is offering, which I think is a disaster as well. Um, look, I'm not going to disagree. You know, it is a Stalinist system you know, initiated by Lenin in terms of the political structure. Um, you know, that, that broader question is, is, can China reform without disintegrating a la the Soviet Union is a question that the Communist Party elite has been asking itself for 20 years and taking great steps to make sure that it doesn't collapse in the manner of the Soviet Union. Um, the, the great challenge, I think, is it's actually, by defining itself, the problem with the Soviet Union is it moved towards a capitalist system, it abandoned all these things. So it almost defined, China defined itself and calcified its self-definition as um, opposed to whatever it was that the Soviets were trying to do. And the problem is that it locks us, it, it, um, it forecloses even directional changes or makes much more difficult directional changes towards reform because once you start down the slippery slope of reform or opening or glasnost, you cannot control it and it all runs away. Um, uh, personally, I think it's a much, the most, it, it's better to avoid getting stuck into the polar kind of conversation of a socialist system or a Western democratic capitalist system because really what we're talking about is a huge spectrum 
in between. I'm just as happy talking about a Japanese democratic system or an Indian democratic system or an Indonesian democratic system. But the point is that nobody in China, in theory, disputes the idea that the system needs to make itself more accountable, give more realisation to the democratic promise that's still in the, um, you know, in the party's rhetoric, being more answerable to its own people, being more accountable, being more transparent, uh, and having a more market-driven mechanism for allocating resources. And once you talk about a question of degree rather than absolutes, I think it's a much more manageable question, which does not make the process any more um, easy. You know, no dictatorship has ever easily um, loosened its grip on, on power. Mm. Thank you. Oh, could you please comment on the number and treatment of political prisoners and the relationship, the current relationship with Russia? Please. Um, oh, we don't know the number of, of, of political prisoners, but um, Dwei Hua, the, the prisoner rights organisation, recently released the number of cases of subversion, which I think by definition are political cases. Um, I think they're running at about 800 subversion convictions a year, um, which is about double what it was before the Tibet riots of 2008, the, the 2009 Xinjiang um, riots, and last year's Arab Spring. All of those were big shock events to the system. Um, so the headline figure is, you know, at a minimum 900 cases a year. Um, and then, of course, there's an enormous um, number of, of less official, less obvious um, political cases, including just informal detentions, interrogations, harassments, and, um, um, and, and political um, convictions, which are, which are packaged in different ways. So, look, um, it's not the gulag at all, um, but it's really significant. It's certainly enough to fulfil the potential, uh, the, the, the deterrence um, um, motive, I think. Um, how significant are particular major cities as power bases in the struggle for leadership in the Politburo? And are there significant political and cultural differences between the cities? Um, well, that's interesting. There's, I mean, there's no, I mean, the party actually makes it quite, or has a deliberate strategy of making sure that no official grows up and becomes the emperor of a fiefdom and then goes and takes over the whole country like used to happen in the old dynastic days. Um, that said, there are some interesting places in China. Obviously, Chongqing became a challenge to parts of the system in Beijing just by the fact that Bo Xilai held up a different flag um, and rallied a huge amount of, of um, support and threatened to take the project national. Shanghai is a particular case because it is the bastion of the former former, former um, General Secretary Jiang Zemin um, and therefore subject to a degree of autonomy that other places weren't. The other place I would mention is um, is a southern coastal area of, of Guangdong province, particularly Guangzhou, which um, sometimes feels like a different country because in Guangzhou it's the same political system, um, people you know, still being convicted of subversion and all of that, but this is a place which has been opening to the outside world for now 34 years, ever since Xi Jinping's father went and opened up Shenzhen in 1978. Um, and, you know, they get half the households in Guangzhou, as far as I can tell, get their satellite TV beamed straight across the border from Hong Kong. Um, they go, you know, some of my friends in Guangzhou told me they went, they go bushwalking every weekend in Hong Kong. Why is that? Oh, because if we get stuck or there's an accident, we know the ambulance will come in Hong Kong. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's a degree to exposure of exposure in the, in the southern tip of China, which is really, really different and makes for a very different society. And those kind of, those impressions and experiences do get kind of washed back into the system. One more question. Yeah. No, no, sorry, sorry. The gentleman with okay. the microphone uh, behind you, sorry. You've got thanks. to have a microphone or you won't <laughs> get on the record. Thank you, John, for your interesting insights. Do you think the new uh, Politburo will change policies in Tibet at all? Look, Tibet's, um, I think, on any measure, a pretty s sad situation at the moment. Um, um, now, just because a policy is unsustainable doesn't mean that it can't be sustained for quite a while. 
um, you know, I, I slipped into Tibet for a little while in, uh, in May, and you know, I've seen some pretty heavy military police um, presences in Western China and Xinjiang before, in particular. Um, but last, uh, you know, by all appearances, it's a it's it's an occupied city. There's um, on every street corner in the Tibetan part of the city um, are armed police, you know, phalanxes of armed police rotating around every two minutes around the main temples. Um, it's people in the Tibetan community wanting to talk to you but aware that, that there's um, informants, you know, in every group. Um, it's a really, really awful situation, really for everybody involved, not least of which, you know, the 80 people who have set fire to themselves in the last two years. Um, now, Again, I think it's one of the key test cases. Can there be a new deal where Tibetans feel um, less disenfranchised in in their in their homelands? Can they be brought into the system and treated by the state more akin to how um, you know people who are people around China can now voice their own opinions and can protect their own interests, uh, and that's become an acceptable acceptable part of social life in mainstream China. Can that de same deal be extended to to Tibet and to Xinjiang, also put in the same category? Um, look, I'm not going to make a prediction, but I think it's one of the really important litmus tests about the future of, of, of China. Hmm. Um, it's just gone so quickly as ever, talking to you, uh, John. Um, the rise and fall of the House of Bo is John Garno's Penguin Special, and it's extra special because it's the first Penguin Special to be turned into an actual book, um, rather than e-book. It's under ten bucks. You can get it down the end of the hall, and I'm sure John will give you an autograph in any Chinese language you can think of. <laughs> um, it's been wonderful to, to see you and to, to have you here, and I hope I see you in Beijing. Uh, thank you very much. Please thank John Garner.